big round of applause for Professor Lewin. A week from today, as part of that lecture on resonances and musical instruments, I need, as I've done for 45 years, I need some people to come with a musical instrument. And I know you get incredibly scared because you're standing here in front of an audience, but what I'm going to ask you is very simple. I'm going to ask you to play on your instrument one tone, the middle A of the piano, 440 hertz. That's not unreasonable. You don't have to be an expert for that. Then you get the option, but that is your decision. You get the option that you may play anything you want with a maximum time of 30 seconds. But if you don't want that, that's okay too. Now, you have to reach me by email. I cannot make any commitment to you within one day. I may get five offers for five violins. I don't want five violins. I may only need one violin. But I want a large variety of instruments, various different kinds of wind instruments, a flute, but also a tuba. So please send me email, and then I will exchange email with you and tell you at some point in time yes or no, or I may at one point in time say, you are on standby. <laughs> okay, so this is my email address. And I will erase that because we don't want that on television. I get too many emails. We did talk last time about power sources. Remember, there was uh, Michael, who was trying to generate here, with muscle power, 100 watts. And after three minutes, he almost fell dead on the floor. <laughs> he couldn't. It's that difficult. There are other sources, of course, to generate electricity. The most common that you are familiar with, we talked already about power stations, but the most common that you use in your house are probably batteries in many different forms. Uh, in every car is a car battery. Here is one, 12 volts. You probably have smoke alarms or radios which have the famous 9 volt battery, which is this small, Plus pole, minus pole. All of you must be familiar to this kind of battery. And then there is a very common one, which is called the AA battery, which is also one and a half volts. Not also, that one was nine. This is one and a half volts. Sometimes you put four in one unit. They're very common. And then there are some that are so small that you can't even see them. They are the batteries that are in watches. I have one here, and I have one here in my hearing aid. This small. There's no way I could show them to you. But you're familiar with them. Each appliance requires a specific voltage, and it requires a specific electric current. If your radio needs a 9-volt battery, it will not work on a one and a half volt battery. And if you connect it to the 110 volts, which is easy to get, you blow your radio apart. What counts is that you really give it the right voltage and the right current. 
If you double the voltage, for whatever reason, in general, the current also doubles. And if your voltage goes down by 50 percent, in general, the current goes also down by 50 percent. And that brings me to an enormously important concept in electricity, and that is power. We discussed that last time, which is joules per second, for which we write what? And power P is the product between the voltage and the current I. So additionally, we write for the current I. So now imagine that I have a 24 watt light bulb. I happen to have one here. You will see it very shortly. And I connect it to a 12 volt car battery, which we have there. So the voltage is 12 volts, that V. So now I can calculate the current that is necessary for that light bulb. That is the 24 divided by the 12. So that is 12, a uh, 2 amperes. We express the current in amperes. So I can connect this 12 volt car battery to this light bulb. I give it the right voltage and it's going to get the right current. And it's happy. If now I lower the voltage, both the voltage and the current will go down, that means the power will go down, and that means it will get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer because it doesn't get what it really needs. If I were so stupid to connect it to 110 volts, which is very easy, we have that readily available, that means I go from 12 volts to 110 volts. That means I make the voltage roughly 10 times higher. But if the voltage get 10 times higher, I told you the current also get 10 times higher. So the power will get 100 times higher. So you better belie believe it if I were so stupid to do that, that that bulb, bulb would be blown to pieces. Now comes my usual question. <laughs> and you know what that question is. <laughs> Do you want to see it? Yeah. <laughs> it's always the same answer, Bill. <laughs> All right. I think that's it. I have to st stick this in here. You ready? 110 volts? I think we are convinced that I blew it, right? <laughs> As a kid, I tested 9-volt batteries by touching my tongue. You cannot do that with 1.5-volt batteries because the poles are on different sides, but you can't do that with a 9-volt battery. If it hurts a lot, the battery is very good. <laughs> if you feel nothing, throw it out. I'll try it. Ah! <laughs> this is a good one. The question now is, is high voltage always dangerous? People think high voltage is dangerous. Very often it's not. What kills you is not so much the voltage, but what kills you is the current. If the current is high enough for long enough of time, that could be fatal. When you take a comb and you comb your hair, I've done it last time, it's very easy to get your hair up to 30,000 volts. No problem at all. You can hear the sparks even. You can hear the cracking noise. 
And if you were in front of a mirror and it were dark, you turned the light off, you would even see some light sparks. Easily 30,000 volts. Current is very low. It doesn't kill you. There's something you should try. Put on some nylon underwear. Stand in front of a mirror, make it completely dark in the room, and take that underwear off. You will see that almost the entire body begins to glow because nylon, it very quickly when you take it off, gets potential differences, 30,000 volts and more. So you get sparks, and they make light. But it has to be completely dark, and you have to stand in front of a mirror. And if you want to do it, if you want to really have fun, you should do it together with a friend. <laughs> if you scuff your feet, we've all done that in the winter. You sit on a chair, you walk over the carpet, you stuff your feet, you grab the doorknob of a metal door, you get a shock, a real substantial shock. Chances are, could be 50,000, could be 60,000 volts. Current is low, not dangerous. This instrument that I'm going to demonstrate to you, you see it there was invented by a famous physicist, Lord Kelvin. It's called the Kelvin water dropper. He invented this in the 19th century. There is water in here, nothing special. The water runs out here, and the water runs out there. Everything that is red here is metal. That's important. There's a metal can here, which is open at the top and the bottom, open at the top. There's one there. And the water goes through there into a bucket. You see those big buckets there. This can is connected with a conducting wire with this bucket, and this can is connected with a conducting wire with that bucket. And these two wires cannot touch each other. Even if they were insulated, they cannot even be close to each other because I'm going to generate 30 or 60,000 volts with this machine, just with pure water. And if these wires are too close together, spark will fly over between these wires, and we don't want that. What we want is we want to see here sparks fly over. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate here. So you see there the water, you see the two cans, which are open, you see the two buckets, you see the wires that connect the way I indicated, and here you see these two metal sticks. At the end of each metal stick is a ball. I'm first going to let the water run with the light on in the lecture hall, and then, when the sparks start, I will make it darker. It takes a while in the beginning to build up to 20, 30, 40,000 volts. It depends on the humidity. That's why this morning at 6 o'clock we turned on the AC in this room, to get the humidity low. It's a rule of thumb that if you get a spark over a distance of one centimeter, that means roughly 30,000 volts. Two centimeter is about 60,000 volts. With this machine, I may be able to get one centimeter, but I'm sure it will work at five millimeter, six millimeter, and then I would still have something like 20,000 volts. So I'll start the water running And now you have to be a little patient. 
So maybe we, oh, there you see them already. And what did we agree, Bill, on the light? Was it dim six or was it completely dark? It was dim six. Yeah, it was dim six. The people who were sitting close could even see the sparks here shortly. Others can see the spark there. The separation between the two balls is now, I would say, about six millimeters. So be patient. Yeah, yeah. I know it's working. I'll tell you shortly how I know that. Oh, yeah. Come on, baby. I saw the search part. Did you see it? Mm -hmm. Now you will get more. Yes. You see it? OK? Now, there's something very interesting. You remember that I showed you about these tinsels, when they get charged, that they spread? The water is going to do the same thing. When the water that comes out below this can gets charged, which it will because it's charging up these cans, it will also spread. You can see that. Do the same thing as the tinsels. It will spread, and then when it spreads enough, you know the spark will be coming, and then the water goes back to its original way. And you can hear the difference. I'll try to make you hear the difference. That is not so easy, but I will try that. You're supposed to see the water now. And let's see whether you can see it spread. I can see it spread. Ah, and the spark. Can you hear it also? Yes. Uh, maybe with my microphone. So you first hear, hear the water running normally, then the sound gets softer because it spreads, and then <coughs> comes the spark. So I'll go back to the sparks because that's what you like much more. I can try to open it a little to see whether we can get it up. You saw it. It's now about a centimeter apart. OK, I think you've seen enough. Isn't this an amazing instrument? I get lots of email from six, seven-year-old who watch my lectures, and they say, this is going to solve the energy problem of the world. <laughs> if you calculate the efficiency of this, it's negligible. If you let water fall down in a waterfall, and you generate electricity that way, it's 10,000 times more efficient. So this is not going to solve the world energy problem. But it is an amazing toy. Many of my students have tried to build one, and I encourage you to build one. Turn the lights on again, thank you, Bill. I uh, advise you to build one. The mistake that most people make, why it doesn't work, this has to be very well insulated from the table. Uh, three or four plates of porcelain. 
here too. And this can that is being supported should be supported, supported with something that is an enormously good insulator. Look, plastic, this long. If you don't do that, you get all kinds of electric leaks and you never reach your 30,000 volts. So try to uh, build one at home. The most fascinating high voltage generator is named after Professor Van der Graaf, Robert Van der Graaf. He invented it in 1929 when he was a professor in Princeton and he built one that produced 500,000 volts. He came to MIT in 1931 and he built one here that would go up to 1.5 million volts. We have two, in fact we have more than two. We have this one which goes up to 100,000 volts. We have several copies of them. And we have one that is larger that goes up to 300,000 volts, but I can only use that one in the winter. There's too much moisture in the air and then you have difficulties. All these electrostatic experiments don't work well when there is moisture in the air. The 100,000 volts still works quite well. So the first thing I want you to see that just by producing 100,000 volts compared to the 20, 30,000 volts there, that now I can draw sparks over a much larger distance. We'll make it a little darker in a minute. Sparking now. Can we make it a little darker that they can see the sparks? Easily 120,000 volts. I will now put a little bit confetti on top of the dome of this Van de Graaff generator. The dome is positively charged, by the way. Not that that's so important, but I thought I'd mention it. And let me put some confetti on top. Oh, and you guess what's going to happen when I turn this machine on. Who wants to make an intelligent guess? Come on, don't be too shy. We talked about it the other day when I had my comb. My comb was not 120,000 volts, but the same idea. You all afraid to say something, right? Yeah? It will do this? Come on. <laughs> the dome is positively charged. These pieces of confetti are in touch with the dome. So they immediately will get positively charged. Positively charged, repel each other, so they go whoom. Except for a few that may stick on the dome. And I can't tell you why, because that was one of the problems that you were going to solve, remember, because the same thing happened with my comb. Most of the pieces of confetti would immediately repel when they had touched the comb, but some stuck. All right. I predict that most, maybe even all, will fly up. <laughs> Not very romantic, right? None left. Now, we're going to enter the more dangerous part of the experiment. And therefore, I have to blow away. The paper.
So now, I'm going to put my body at 120,000 volts. And to convince you that I really am at very high voltage, I will hold the famous tinsels in my hand, and boy, will you see them spread. So let's do that first. All right. None of this stuff is without danger, unless you know what you were doing. OK. Discharge bill. OK. Mm -hmm. Let go. All right. I have my hand on the dome. Please turn on, Bill. I'm now about 120,000 volts. Discharge, please. OK. Now I'm going to do the same thing and put some confetti on my hand. What do you think will happen now? I think you know the answer. I'm 120,000 volts. This was 120,000 volts. So the confetti will <coughs> put them on my hand. You know, I prefer my right hand, but that's the detail. <laughs> uh, can you blow the, make sure that there's, there's no confetti there, huh? Yeah. Also, no, this, this is too close. All kinds of crazy discharges. Can you discharge? Yeah, that's OK. Go ahead. <laughs> so one left. <laughs> Goes. Do you discharge? The tinsel spread. The tinsel spread when they have the same charge, they repel. The water spreads when it gets to high voltage and it spreads. If you have long hair, which I don't, <laughs> and if it is nicely washed, it will also spread. We'll try to show that to you, since I don't have long... <laughs> Discharge, please. Go ahead. <laughs> this is the way that kids think about me, the, <laughs> the mad scientist. Discharge. <laughs> Is there any woman in the audience who, number one, has hair not much longer than this? Number two, washed her hair this morning. <laughs> Number three, put no conditioner in her hair. No fat, nothing of any kind. If there's any one of them, I would love to have her here. She would not need a wig. Come on. Always, when I do this, there's always one person who volunteers. In the worst case, it fails. That means you use conditioner. <laughs> no one 
So it means that you don't wash your hair in the morning, right? <laughs> OK. At least you have courage. <laughs> Wonderful. What is your name? Carmen. 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 Carmen, wonderful name. Hold my hand, you'll need it. Other hand, <laughs> and come with me. Follow my instructions strictly. Okay. If you don't follow them, this may be the last time that you do <laughs> this. Go on the chair. How about the shoes? How about the shoes? Shoes is fine. Because you're going to stand there. Okay. Yeah. Make sure you're well balanced. Okay. You're completely insulated now. This much plastic between her and the floor. We don't want discharges. We don't want any confetti around. <laughs> no. Because you get discharges through the confetti. I discharged it. Now you can put your hand on it. Just uh, the ring is no problem. <laughs> it may be the end of your marriage, but that's a detail. <laughs> yeah, put your hand on it. Nothing will happen. It's, it's completely discharged. That's what I did. No. Hold your hand on it. Shake your hand a little, head a little. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Shake a little more. Oh, oh. <laughs> Shake a little more. You look so beautiful. <laughs> You're gorgeous. Take your hand off. Take my hand. <laughs> yeah. So you, you were still charged, and you're naturally isolated. So this little shock is just Friendship. normal. And <laughs> it's a Friendship. 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 A from little, Spain, a from Spain. A little suffering for the sake of science is good. <laughs> Step down, so a spark was flying between us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I'm going to do the ultimate dangerous experiment. So far, I charge myself up to 100,000 volts, but I was smart enough not to let any current going through me. I'm going to change that now. <laughs> I'm going to hold this in my hand. It's insulated my hand from the tube, fluorescent tube. So this is an insulator. So no current will flow through here, through my body, to the ground. So there's no danger if I hold this close to the Van der Graaff. But the moment I touch it here, then the current can go through here, through the fluorescent tube, through my body, to the ground. But of course, I have to touch it here. And when I do that, you will know. <laughs> Not only will you see light, but you will hear something. <laughs> uh, let me think, Bill. I think I can turn it on myself, yeah. It has to be made completely dark. I do it once more, but that's it. 
Okay. Thank you. Now, we're going to change the topic completely. I'm now going to ask you the question, and I will answer it for you. Why is the sky blue? Why are clouds white? And why are sunsets red? We all know that sunlight is composed of many colors. When you see a rainbow, you see that the white light from the sun decomposes in colors. When that sunlight goes through air, which contains very, very small particles, smaller than a tenth of a micron. A micron is a millionth of a meter. A tenth of that is even ten times small. But it has to be even smaller than that. Smaller than a tenth of a micron. Then of the white light from the sun, light will scatter off those small particles, and the blue light that is present in the sunlight has a six times higher chance to scatter than the red light. That phenomenon is called Rayleigh scattering. And in our atmosphere, are many particles which are that small, which are smaller than one-tenth of a micron. And so, I will now make a drawing. I can still do that here. So you're standing here. This is the atmosphere. And the sunlight, the sun is there, very far away. Sunlight is coming in like this. You look at the sky, and what do you see? You see scattered light. But what do you think the color of that scattered light is? What is the color of that scattered light? It's blue. Because blue has a higher probability than anything else. So it looks blue in this direction. If you look here, it's blue that is dominating. If you look here, it's blue that is dominating. If you look here, it's blue that is dominating. Unless you look straight into the direction of the sun, you will see that almost everywhere the sky is blue. But now comes the question, why are clouds white? Well, the particles in a cloud are small water drops. They are five microns or larger. And when particles are that big, Rayleigh scattering is not operative. Blue light is no longer preferred to scatter, but all colors, all the colors of the light of the sun scatter by the same amount. Well, if you see all the colors from the sun coming in your eyes, you see white light. That's the idea of the mixture of all colors. So that's the reason why the clouds are white. So here's a cloud, and the light of the sun strikes it. The small water drops will scatter the light, but will be white. Now, when it's really bad weather, you may have noticed 
when you hear and you look up to the cloud, they're not so white at all that they are actually on the dark side. That happens, not always, but it happens. The reason for that is that then the clouds are just too thick. Clouds also absorb light. And so if the cloud is thick enough, well, then so much light is absorbed that comes in from the sun that the bottom just becomes dark. But that same cloud that would look dark from below, if you flew over with an airplane, I guarantee you that it's white. That scattering, by the way, of large particles, which gives you no preference for any color, we call that me scattering. I'm going to demonstrate this to you first using cigarette smoke. I have here a floodlight which shines light straight up. I just turned it on. And we're going to make it very dark in the room. So there's only this light going up. You won't see that light because you can only see the light if it changes direction from going this way to this way. If it doesn't do this, it doesn't come in your eyes. Well, I will make it go in your direction because I'm going to put cigarette smoke here. And in cigarette smoke, are many particles smaller than the tens of a micron. Blue light will come in your direction. Now, there are also particles which are substantially larger than the tens of a micron. Tough luck, they will show you white light. But what you will see, that the overall impression of that light that came up here, scattered in your direction, the overall impression will be that it is bluish, and that I want to bring first to a test. So, I need some cigarettes, because I need some smoke. I hate this experiment. This is really a terrible experiment. Well, we talked about the sacrifice for the sake of science, right? <laughs> I really need smoke. All right, Bill, you can make it dark. Okay, now try to be a little kind to me. Try to make it see bluish. <laughs> but be honest at the same time. Who agrees to me with me and says, yeah, it is bluish? Say yeah. yeah. Okay. Those of you who do not agree, say no. no. Well, the yes have it. Now I'm going to convince the no's how wrong they were. I'm going to take the smoke in my lungs. I'm going to inhale it. And in my lungs is a lot of moisture. And so water will precipitate on these very, very small particles, the ones that gave the blue light that were smaller than a tenth of a micron, and these particles will grow in size. And before you know, they are much larger than a tenth of a micron. Then I will blow that smoke out. It has to be white, because they're no longer small particles. So if I hold the smoke into my lungs for a minute or so, and I blow it out, it will be white. But before I blow it out, 
I want you to see the difference. And so just before I blow it out, I will first show you this again so that you can compare. And then I will blow it out. It's one of the worst experiments <laughs> I've ever done. Did you see the color change? No question, right? Even though I agree the first one wasn't really blue, not as blue as the sky, it was bluish. I want to show you two slides now um, of Rayleigh scattering in a very different way. So, Bill, if you can turn the lights off and if John can give us the first slide. You see here a cluster of stars. It's called the Pleiades. I'm sure all of you have heard about the Pleiades. It's about 400 light years away from us. And these stars in this cluster are very hot, hotter than the sun even. They produce very clear white light. But they are surrounded by very fine dust. And so the light from the stars is scattered in your direction, because the photograph was taken from your side, and you very clearly see that that scattered light is blue. So that blue that you see is a straightforward example of Rayleigh scattering. Next slide, please. Here you see a man on the moon. Now there's no atmosphere on the moon, so the moon doesn't have a blue sky. But astronauts that walk on the moon have a package on their back to cool them, because it can be very hot on the moon. And there is always an exhaust of water vapor. And since the moon is vacuum, this water vapor immediately evaporates and turns into exceedingly small water drops, apparently small enough that the light that scatters off them becomes blue. And so this astronaut, when he looks at the sky, is completely black, has created around himself his local blue sky, which is the result from the fact that he is wearing this cooling pack. Remarkable, when I first saw this, remarkable how this really scattering makes him create his own atmosphere. Can I have the lights, please? <coughs> Why are sunsets red? Well, when the sun is high in the sky, about 1% of the sunlight is scattered comes from above, comes in this direction, you're standing here, and so the amount of atmosphere that it has to go through is relatively small. 
when the sun is only five degrees above the horizon, so the sunlight comes in this way, then already it has to go through a much thicker layer of atmosphere. About 10% is being scattered, by the way, at five degrees. When the sun is near the horizon and the light comes in this way, then it has to go through an unbelievable thickness of the Earth's atmosphere. Just a matter of geometry. The thickness is so enormous that all the light that was blue in the sunlight has been scattered out already. So whatever is left over, the only color that can make it through is red. And that's the reason why when the sun is so low in the sky, whether it rises or whether it sets, is irrelevant. That's the reason why the sun turns red. And if there were here a cloud, and the sun were there near the horizon, this side of the cloud will turn red. You can clearly see that in the sky. So the interesting thing is the same reason why the sky is blue is why the sun is red when it sets. Because the blue light has been sucked out by this huge layer of atmosphere that the sun has to shine through. The moon does the same thing when it rises and when it sets, also red. Stars and planets do the same thing. You may not have noticed it, but when Venus just comes up over the horizon, just red, beautifully red. The dirtier the atmosphere, volcanic eruptions, the more beautiful are the sunsets. The more pollution in the air, the more beautiful are our sunsets. I want to show you the next slide, my last slide. Can we turn the lights off? This is something truly amazing. This little piece, this solid piece that this person holds in his hand is called aerogel. It weighs, the density is only four times higher than the density of air. Imagine a solid with a density only about four times higher than the air. It contains of silicon dioxide particles which are way smaller than a tenth of a micron. So they are ideal for Rayleigh scattering. And look at it. The light that comes from above is scattered in your direction. And what do you see? Blue light. There it is. This is blue. Light comes from above. You see a shadow here. But it is so thick that when the light emerges, all the blue has already been removed. So what is left over? Red. That's the reason why sunsets are red. You see that here. You see here in one slide why our sky is blue, and you see why our sun when it sets is red, with one piece of aerogel, an amazing material it is. Yeah, I can have the lights again, thank you. I now want to create for you, in the lecture hall, blue light, a blue sky, and a red sunset. If you're sitting here, you're lucky, then you will see it very well. If you sit there, you will not see it so well. But look, you get what you paid for. <laughs> I have here 
a bucket of sodium thiosulfate. If I put in that liquid, which is very transparent, looks like water, if I put sulfuric acid in here, then sulfur will precipitate. And these sulfur particles are smaller than a tenth of a micron. And so the light that will come from this gun in this direction, that light will then, due to the sulfur, scatter in your direction, and you will see it blue. So you will see the blue sky right in front of you. That's why I put you in, Neil, that you would see it so well. <laughs> you won't see it so well, although even at an angle you might see blue. But this is only part of the demo. That's the sun. This light goes through this liquid, and that's the sun. And now I'm going to add H2SO4, sulfuric acid. The sky will become blue, but in time, more and more and more and more sulfur will precipitate. That means the light has to go through thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker layers of these particles, which is equivalent what the sunset, what the sun is doing when it's low to the horizon. So what do you think will happen with the sun? What? It will turn red. It will turn red. You are fantastic. <laughs> OK. Uh, so I will first put in the sulfuric acid in daylight. And then I will stir, and then we'll make it dark, and then we need patience. I will stir a little. Let's make it dark. And now, be patient. The blue of the sky, and it will very shortly turn blue, the more the color of the sun will change. Right now, sun looks quite normal. Three o'clock in the afternoon. Hey, I see the sky turning blue. Who can see it too? Yeah, you see, it's, it's more difficult there. You can really see the sky turning blue. That's really scattering of these very small sulfur particles. Hey, look at the sun. It's four o'clock. It's clear. It's no longer as bright as it was. It's clearly turning slightly reddish already. Who would have thought ever in your life, in a lecture hall of MIT, to see a red sunset? <laughs> Isn't that immensely romantic? <laughs> Outsiders think of MIT students, and that includes even professors, as nerds. Well, <laughs> to create a red sunset, it's not very nerdy, is it? Isn't this beautiful? Look at the sun. And look at the sky. <laughs> it's past six, seven o'clock already, you can tell. To be frank with you, I think we are getting very close to, to sunset. <laughs> yeah! 
Yeah. Yeah. Lights. I hope you'll bring your musical instrument a week from today and send me email. And then we'll agree on which instruments we will choose. I hope you have a good weekend. See you Monday.